Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, we are just three minutes up because we are waiting for the fourth speaker. He's not coming. I think probably he joined us in time given the concessions for Delhi's traffic. Anyway, so uh, we'll go ahead now. Uh, on behalf of uh, the India International Center and the D.S. Borka Memorial Foundation, welcome this evening to the third edition of the keys to governance in memory of uh, Shekhar Borkar. We've had two uh, seminars in this series earlier. The one in 2016 was, uh, uh, in fact, had uh, four of Shekhar's friends uh, on the panel. There was T.S. Krishnamurti, the former Chief Election Commissioner of India, Hardeyal Singh, the former Income Tax Ombudsman and Additional Secretary at the CBC and a columnist presently with the Financial Express. Rajiv Kher, the former uh, Commerce Secretary and then the member of the Competition Appellate Tribunal. And uh, Neera Chandyok, uh, visiting professor at the Center for Law and Governance, JNU. Uh, in the second uh, edition, we had uh, again a, a friend of Shekhar's, uh, E.S. Sarma, the former Economic Affairs Secretary and Power Secretary, and now a civil society campaigner for sustainable development based in Vishakhapatnam. Then we had P.K. Tripathi, the former Chief Secretary of Delhi, and then Chairman of the Public Grievances Commission of Delhi. Uh, the third speaker was Professor Gurpreet Mahajan, Professor, Center for Political Studies, JNU. And then we had a young economist, Dr. Ritika Khera, Associate Professor of Economics at IIT Delhi. This time, again, we have a very distinguished panel and uh, uh, a little difficult subject also, but very much uh, relevant to our times and uh, what's happening in our country. Uh, we have Professor Balvi Arora, Professor Emeritus and Chairman Center for Multilevel Federalism and former Professor JNU. Nandini Sundar, Professor of Sociology, Delhi School of Economics. I must mention that Nandini gave the Borkar Memorial Lecture in 2008 and uh, uh, spent, uh, uh, and we, the family spent the evening with, and Shekhar was very much there. So uh, she is the one only on the panel who knew Shekhar. And then uh, we have uh, Dr. Himanshu, Associate Professor, Center for Economic Studies and Planning, JNU, and Professor Vivek Kumar, who hopefully should be joining us uh, shortly, Professor at the Center for Study of Social Systems, JNU. For those who are uh, not aware of uh, uh, Shekhar, just a few words. Shekhar, the banana boy on the Indian postage stamp, a private sector administrator, a citizen environmentalist and advocate of empowerment of persons with disabilities passed away today in 2015. And the D.S. Borker Memorial Foundation thought it very fit to organize this series of seminars in his name. Now, uh, without further ado, there are two small rituals which we have to do before we begin. One is uh, I have to uh, request uh, 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 f uh, family members to present the Angavastram. Now, this is an old uh, ritual of the family. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, each speaker has uh, 15 minutes, and then we open it to the floor uh, for discussion. Uh, during this discussion, I think we will be touching upon uh, the core objectives of the Constitution, uh, sovereignty, socialism, secularism, democracy, the republican character, uh, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, human dignity, and of course, the unity and integrity of our country. Oh, Vivek. Uh, Come. Uh, hey, she's here there? Yeah, yeah. yeah, come, we'll do that needful now. Yeah. 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 So uh, we'll, uh, uh, can I request uh, Professor Balbir Arora to open the discussion? Sorry. Thank you, Suhas. And uh, let me say at the outset that I'm uh, very pleased to join in this uh, uh, discussion uh, that you've organized in memory of your brother Shekhar. Uh, when you spoke to me, uh, the way you phrased the question uh, attracted me straight away because, uh, of course, your, your series is on governance, but the Constitution as ideology is something which makes us think and it's always been in this light that I have seen constitutions. A lot of uh, thinking on constitutions gets put off by the fact that it is a lengthy legal document. It is not a document for lawyers alone, though of course they uh, spend a lot of time on it. It is a political document. It is a political document because it represents, at a certain point of time, the balance of forces, of political forces, of economic, social forces, which come together to agree on a compact. And that compact uh, is what keeps Indian democracy going it is something that is renewed by each political generation with additions, with interpretations, and of course the other, uh, the other uh, qualification that is often added to the uh, word constitution is that it's a living document, that it is constantly evolving to meet the needs of the time is constantly changing. So I don't see uh, amendments as a weakness in the document, uh, provided they uh, stick to uh, the core. And I think that is what I would like to dwell upon, is that what is the core, what is the, what, what the Supreme Court has called the basic structure, where it has ring-fenced, as it were, a certain number of features of the Constitution uh, and has uh, left it, in my view, very wisely, deliberately open. Open-ended in the sense that they are free to add to it as and when the occasion arises. And, and that acts as a deterrent because you never know what will be uh, uh, what will be uh, included in that uh, basic structure doctrine. And we saw recently the challenge which uh, put, uh, gave uh, privacy uh, the status of a fundamental right. I think that uh, illustrates the fact that this is an ideological document and where it uh, denies recognition of certain basic uh, rights, 
it is also uh, making a statement, a political statement, an ideological statement, which goes far beyond the legal framework. A compact renewed, as I said, by successive political generations, a basic law, which is the basis for the rule of law. I think uh, base, as in base and what is built on it, the structure which is built on it is uh, uh, re represents, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the basis, the basic structure, the rule of law uh, permeates the entire edifice that is built on it. Now, this is where we have some problems. I think what I'd like to mention at this stage is that it is also a crucible of wide-ranging and often divergent hopes. It has been right from the beginning. We saw the tensions in the Constituent Assembly and the compromises and how they were arrived at, some of them very tentative, and uh, those debates continue. The competing claims, one author right at the beginning, you, uh, we were all taught, uh, his, uh, prescribed his book, uh, Granville Austin, Red Austin uh, called it uh, a social revolution. And of course he was immediately challenged by those who felt that the Constituent Assembly had not gone far enough including my former colleague at the Delhi University, uh, Shivani Chobe, who uh, very uh, pertinently uh, uh, went through the uh, arguments and said, is this the base on which the social revolution is going to take place? Now, these have been different opinions, different uh, attempts at reconciling uh, competing claims at a given point of time, but then these claims have come up again and again. And these claims keep coming up even now when we see the, the socio-political upheavals and struggles that are uh, going on. Uh, these claims uh, have to be settled on the basis of the current understanding of the ideology of the Constitution without sacrificing the basic uh, features that we have already talked about, which is, uh, well, most often what is cited are the, um, are the uh, terms used in the preamble, the justice, so, uh, social, economic, and political, and of course the clarion call for liberty, equality, and fraternity. But I think taking those forward uh, the Supreme Court, of course, has been uh, entrusted with the responsibility of developing for each uh, period what, in effect, is going to be the ruling ideology. It is the, in that sense that we see uh, the changes that have taken place over time. Now, I'd like to... Uh, divide what I have to say to you in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I would like to uh, mention what I consider to be a core feature of the Constitution, which uh, uh, is particularly relevant in our times, and that is the feature which emphasizes and accepts the uh, quality of tolerance and acceptance of religious pluralism. A lot, many words are used for this, but religious diversity and the respect for the core values, uh, uh, often translated as secularism and uh, laicity uh, in the French sense, uh, these are. Uh, words which 
try to express the underlying philosophy that is very much a part of the constitutional ideology, which is pluralism and the acceptance and tolerance of diversity. The initial uh, federal plan uh, before independence was designed precisely, and a lot of effort went into it, to accommodate religious diversity. And when that failed, uh, after partition, the, uh, there were many proponents, uh, many who argued that there was no need for federalism anymore, since the, the raison d'etre for it had vanished, the country had been divided. But Sena Council prevailed, and it was seen as not only being necessary for the other forms of diversity, uh, sociolinguistic, but also the spirit which may not have uh, kept its relevance in so far as federal reorganization was concerned because uh, very often federalism is called the territorial dimension of politics and it was quite obvious that uh, it would be very difficult to have uh, another territorial uh, structuring on the basis of uh, religion. But the principle itself was uh, very forcefully uh, incorporated in the Constitution, and I think it remains uh, a, a, a core feature of the uh, of the basic structure. The defense of secularism, in my view, is an integral part of the defense of the rule of law. Seeing it as something different, as an ideology in itself, with whatever connotations one might put on it, is, I think, impoverishing the idea. Because it is when, when the plural, pluralism that is enshrined in the Constitution is defended, the rule of law is defended. And each time it is violated, the rule of law is violated. Unfortunately, not all of these violations, these transgressions, are uh, brought to um, uh, book, uh, persecuted, but they remain nevertheless violations of the rule of law. This precious legacy of pluralism that is embedded and enshrined in the Constitution is therefore in my view, something worth defending, and particularly in our times, something that we need to um, actively uh, pay attention to uh, in terms of the numerous uh, petty erosions of this core value. Insofar as the transition to the other a theme that I wanted to address today uh, is that, as I mentioned, secularism was linked right at the outset in our constitutional history at birth to the principle, the second principle that I would like to focus on, the principle of federalism. <coughs> now, there again, it's, it's, it's seen as a set of institutions, but it is a principle of organization based on the idea of the respect of pluralism. And that is the essence of the federal principle. What shapes it takes, what uh, most people associate it with um, a complicated set of uh, legal uh, uh, rules and lists of, demo, of, uh, of uh, jurisdiction and so on. I think there's much more to it. We have to go to its core, to its uh, guiding principle, and the principle of federalism is at the base uh, of the, uh, derived from the same principle that secularism is derived from, is that uh, of pluralism and the respect 
for diversity. So if we take, and this is the second point that I'm uh, wanting to put place before you, if we take the federal principle as a core element of the Constitution, a structural principle which finds expression in institutions, and I would go so far as to say that the principle is strongly entrenched in society, but its institutional expressions are often wanting. The, uh, the, the uh, thinking is, even though you, some people have argued what is the word in the uh, uh, Indian languages for federalism, there is a word, it's a complicated word. But the, the idea of respect for others, their beliefs, their ways of life, their pluralism, is very much enshrined and embedded in society. How we are to articulate it in terms of legal or constitutional uh, principles is a challenge that we have. Uh, but it, it's, there is no difficulty in getting that principle accepted in society. It's not something that one is trying to push uh, against their will. Uh, it's not a foreign principle, it's the word it of course, comes to us from elsewhere. If the principle is strongly embedded in society, but is uh, the institutional expression has its weakness, then the other values that are associated with pluralism, which is flexibility and adaptation, they have many words for this, accommodation, adjustment, they are valuable attributes and not liabilities. A flexible federal constitution, uh, constitution an adaptable one, most often the, the, the uh, features cited are the Article 3, which uh, allows the states to be uh, refashioned, uh, their boundaries recreated, and so on, and uh, all the special status, which allows a certain amount of flexibility to meet uh, specific uh, requirements uh, born either through historical or geopolitical um, reasons. This, in my view, these are attributes which have served Indian federalism well. There are many federal countries across the globe which have collapsed and broken up because they did not have the flexibility to uh, accommodate uh, changes or uh, adjustments that were required. So I think we should not see them uh, as, as negatives but as positives. The last idea that I would like to place before you is the notion of progressive federalism. Now, what is progressive federalism? It's, it's a term that has recently come into currency. Federalism, incidentally, is a term uh, with which over 136 adjectives are associated, from competitive to cooperative to this and that. Now, so why am I adding one more? Actually, it has to do with the fact that if the states have the jurisdictions and the powers, if the center is adopting regressive policies, the states can counter it by uh, adopting progressive policies. The term has come up in the context of the present American uh, situation, where regressive uh, initiatives of Washington are being countered uh, by progressive states which refuse, uh, with the help of the judiciary, which refuse to uh, implement them or allow them. Now, which opens uh, a window uh, of uh, a window for our own system uh, of uh, uh, taking positions at the state level. And uh, one of the examples was the 1976 censorship. Uh, of the press. Now, it's very difficult to 
envisage such a censorship in today's day and age because uh, the situation is uh, the, the media is far more diverse but you what you have is a, a situation where it is possible to have pockets of resistance uh, where uh, the core values are defended so to conclude i think the delicate balance of core institutions which have been assigned roles and enjoy relative autonomy is uh, the essence and these two features of the uh, ideology of the constitution uh, namely secularism and federalism are the ones that i wanted to highlight uh, uh, because i know that many other features which are equally important uh, will come up during the course of the discussion thank you Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Professor Balbir Arora, for giving that uh, overview and uh, for highlighting the basis of the rule of law. I mean, if one just goes back to the happenings in Maharashtra a few days ago, and if the rule of law had prevailed, you know, then this uh, this kind of dimension and this kind of uh, um, butchery or uh, this kind of disturbance wouldn't have. Um, taken place. I mean, it's not physical butchery. It's a, it's a butchery of the mind. You know, it's a kind of a, um, uh, you 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 hit out at the, the basic, uh, uh, mindset, uh, of the Dalits, which is, which is abominable, to say the least. Um, now, uh, can I uh, request Nandini to take the floor, please? Thanks, Suhas. Um, it's good to be able to talk about the Constitution these days because, in fact, it's become quite a dangerous word. Um, in the last year or so, uh, several seminars in universities which have the word Constitution uh, in their title or have the word democracy have been cancelled by university administrations as if, you know, we were talking about or the people who were invited or the students were talking about something um, subversive, something anti-national. Um, and you know, all of these are titles like celebrating the constitution, celebrating 70 years of Indian democracy. There have been cases in Allahabad University, in Delhi University, and a number of places I counted between 2016 and 17, about uh, 16 to 20 university events uh, about constitutional values have been canceled. So. Even if um, we don't recognize what a powerful ideological tool the Constitution is, certainly there is somebody who is worried about the values that the Constitution represents. Uh, and when there is talk of change in the Constitution, um, it's clear what kind of changes uh, are being envisioned and what there is a need to defend. Right. So uh, the title of this um, discussion today, Constitution as Ideology, is extremely pertinent because uh, it is the Constitution as ideology that we need to defend rather than the Constitution as actual provision because there are many provisions in the Constitution which are problematic with the passage of time, with new demands. Uh, we all accept that the Constitution is a living document, that it will change, um, that there is a need for change. but. There are also certain things that have come out of a particular past experience which are important to maintain. Now, um, if you look at the Constitution as ideology, there are three aspects to this. One is um, the text itself and what it says uh, in terms of its basic structuring principles, the preamble to the Constitution, the fundamental rights chapters, um, some of the directive principle chapter, uh, the you know directive principles, which are extremely important to the framing of the constitution as ideology, even if not to the actual provisions of uh, the text. Um, so there is the text, which is very important. Number one. The second is the courts in interpreting that text, and um, you know that is, again is a very important aspect of. Judicial ideology is an important aspect of the way in which the Constitution has been understood, interpreted, and enacted. And the third is the people themselves. So the Constitution will be nothing without 
a living population which is engaged in interpreting it, in defending it, in enhancing and enlarging its scope. And what we see in Bhima Koregao, in a variety of different struggles by a variety of different groups, by the Muslim women who went to the Supreme Court in um, against the triple talaq uh, provisions, um, you know, in, uh, by the Dalits who've been protesting about uh, flogging, by other groups who've been protesting about the violation of secularism, and basically the violation of basic fundamental rights in the kind of lynching that we've seen. Um, uh, saying that this has nothing to do with, you know, the lynching of people in the name of cow protection is not to do with the directive principles of the Constitution uh, to protect cows, which is a completely different provision, but it's to do with the complete violation of fundamental rights. So there is, in a sense, uh, the, the third and perhaps the most important aspect of the Constitution is what people bring to it and how they rely on the Constitution to take their struggles forward. So now let me come to each of these three aspects. One is the Constitution as text. When we look at the framing of the Constitution, um, the Constitution Assembly debates, um, you know, one of the encouraging things about the Constitutional Assembly debates is that people were as nasty to each other in those days as people are today. Perhaps not as nasty because Parliament is currently pretty vitiated, uh, but you know, in terms of who's allowed to speak, in terms of the fact that certain minority voices are suppressed, in terms of the fact that there are certain voices which are completely absent. So, for instance, the complete absence of any Muslim League members in the making of the Constitution, the absence of any Communist members, even though they were the second largest party uh, in the 1952 elections. Uh, Somnath Lahiri, who was the sole Communist member, left um, after a while. And the preponderance, in fact, of many members of the Congress Hindu right actually is quite interesting. So the argument, you know, the argument that people often make is that um, this constitution did not reflect um, the views of the Hindu right, did not reflect the views of, and so therefore now they need to bring in those changes is actually completely historically, empirically false. Because if anything, the constitution was far too weighted towards their views, towards their arguments, and uh, if you actually read the text, there's a lot of heckling of Muslim members of the constitution who made, you know, particular comments, etc., as well as of Adivasi members like Jaipal Singh. So in any case, one of the interesting things about the text is, um, well, one is the kind of interaction within the constituent assembly itself, the composition, etc. But what is remarkable is how in the light of everything else that was going on, outside the Constituent Assembly, the partition, um, you know, Telangana arm struggle, uh, all sorts of things that were the Kharsawan massacre of Adivasis in 1948. Uh, despite all of this, there is this kind of sense of decorum and feeling in the Constitution, uh, Constituent Assembly that they had an important task, which was to bring a constitution to this newly emerged nation. And I think that sense of joint purpose, of commonness, is something that was extremely important. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting when uh, Granville Austin talks about how the fundamental rights of the Constitution were being framed in the backdrop of the fundamental wrongs that were happening uh, in the rest of the country. Uh, that's something that we always need to remember, the ability to overcome some of those fundamental wrongs, to put in secularism, um, social, you know, uh, and fundamental rights into the Constitution. And I think the, uh, we cannot deny the great importance of the freedom struggle in shaping that, um, that commitment to the Constitution. And those who did not take part in that freedom struggle, and we know that the RSS did not take part in that freedom struggle, have therefore no commitment uh, to the kind of constitutional values that were upheld in the constitution. So even though there was a preponderance of people in the from the you know the Congress right, people like K.M. Munshi, they were all people who had taken part in the freedom struggle in some form or the other. And there is a big difference between the people of that time and the people of this time who are claiming the right to change the constitution without having taken part in the most fundamental movement which shaped the constitution. 
The third aspect of the text is one, as I said, is outside events. The second is the composition of the constituent assembly itself. The third and the most important is the experience of the freedom struggle. And the fourth is the existing administrative provisions, which, as we know, were taken over in many cases from existing um, provisions, like, for instance, in particular, the Government of India Act of 1935, which has shaped many of the actual administrative provisions of the Constitution. Um, and if there's time, I'll just come to this briefly in terms of the fifth and sixth schedule, because I think Suhas particularly wanted me to talk about how the Adivasi areas of this country have been affected by con the Constitution as ideology. Um, the second, so as I said, the first aspect of the constitution as ideology is the text, and these were the elements that went into the making of the text. The second aspect of the constitution as ideology is the courts. And again, there are three aspects to this, at least. One is what people bring to the courts in terms of the cases uh, that they bring to the court. And the only reason that they can bring these cases to the court is because there are those values in the Constitution which they can invoke. Um, there's very interesting work by Rohit Day, who's been looking at some of the ways in which some of the early cases that came to the Supreme Court uh, and to other courts in the 1950s actually drove uh, the kind of constitutional interpretation that there was. And uh, he talks of sex workers and others who were kind of, you know, all sorts of marginal people who were pushing the court towards greater equality and force. So it's only when people bring cases to the court that the court is forced to take cognizance of these issues. Now, if somebody hadn't brought the right to privacy to the court, then they wouldn't have been able to take up and frame, uh, you know, a doctrine on fundamental rights. So the role of ordinary litigants, and sometimes these are very ordinary litigants who you would never imagine would approach the Supreme Court or approach even you know, a trial court, but it's the public which has eventually shaped court doctrine. The second is the judge's own ideology and the role of senior lawyers. And we see this very clearly in landmark cases like Kesavananda Bharati, where in fact, sometimes the litigant completely drops out of the picture. So in case of Ananda Bharati, it was argued completely by, you know, Nani Palkiwala and other Sirvai and other senior judges with, and poor case of Ananda Bharati was like, oh my God, will I have to pay expenses for this case? Every day I'm reading the newspaper seeing that, you know, this case of Ananda Bharati and what are the lawyers going to charge me? And, you know, it was all being fought in his name, but without, he was a uh, um, mutt pontiff and uh, really, you know, did not have anything to do with this extremely important case on the basic structure of the Constitution. And the third, in terms of what the courts bring to the Constitution, is the text of the Constitution itself. So, again, you see this kind of dialectical interaction between, uh, you know, particular clauses in the Constitution, say, freedom of expression, and the ways in which the courts have interpreted that to prevent book bans, prevent film bans. Um, so although it takes a long time and there is, we know a lot of damage being done to the freedom of expression, uh, in most cases, the courts have eventually guaranteed the freedom of expression, uh, which has been a remarkably uh, wonderful thing. The third thing is Again, to remind ourselves, as I said, the first was the text itself and all that went into making it. The second is the courts and all that goes into the making of uh, particular judgments. The third is the people, quote unquote, and what goes into the making of a public opinion or public ideology. And here again, it's important to remember that, as I said at the beginning, that the court, that the constitution is a living document. And so, for instance, when we are constantly told when it comes to settling conflicts that the government will only talk to certain people, say in Kashmir or Nagaland. I mean, they won't talk to the Maoists at all. We know that. But at least when they're talking to people in Nagaland, they talk, you know, they sometimes make noises about having talks in Kashmir, but it's always within the framework of the constitution. Now, what is within the framework of the constitution? Is it the ideology of... Um, you know, that there should be a respect for federalism, as uh, Professor Arora said, that there should be respect for fundamental rights. And when you think of what's happening in the Northeast, uh, the, uh, the need that there is to talk to various groups, um, 
it's important to remember what spirit Gandhi was bringing to the constitution at that time because when he said you know nothing will be done against the wishes of the Nagas when there should be a dialogue he wasn't referring to you know this closure that came about that you know now you have a part C state now you have this state you have that state but the spirit of dialogue that animated the whole constitution so when we when you when people say they will talk only within the framework of the constitution we need to ask what do you mean by the constitution which framework are you talking about and push for the progressive values of the constitution uh, to be uh, to be developed just to come to the um, question of the fifth and sixth schedules which are which unfortunately many people haven't even heard of in this country which are actually important constitutional provisions governing about 8.6 percent of this country's population adivasis or scheduled tribes uh, the fifth schedule uh, applies to nine states in central india and the sixth schedule applies to the northeast um, it's interesting when you read the Constitutional Assembly debates and some of the uh, kind of committee resolutions and debates that went into the making of the um, making of these schedules. And again, it's important to remember that when we talk about constitutional values, we should not look only at the finished text, because if you the these two. Uh, schedules which give certain rights to uh, scheduled tribes and to people in scheduled areas actually are very watered down provisions of what the constitution assembly members themselves wanted so if you look at the draft constitution it has much stronger provisions for members of the tribes advisory councils for self representation by the tribes than the kind of provisions that were eventually enshrined in the constitution which are extremely watered down versions which give all power to the governor who never exercises those powers, which only involves the tribe's advisory council in some minor consultative role to in matters which have been referred to them by the governor of the state. And um, the whole ideology is extremely protectionist. And in fact, it's also, you know, this is an excellent example. The fifth and sixth schedules are an excellent example of what else was going around the country at that time. And in fact, um, I was reading this work by a young scholar, Sagar Tiwari, uh, on, on the debate between um, B.R. Ambedkar and A.V. Thakkar, who was um, you know, a Gandhian worker for uh, working with uh, Adivasi communities. And Ambedkar was actually quite against giving any representation to the scheduled tribes at all he said they're entirely backward they have no they should have no voting rights uh, and Thakkar Bapa is actually saying that you know um, how can you say that when uh, they are as much citizens of the country as anybody else and there was quite an acrimonious debate in the times of India and um, Ambedkar says well you know there are no educated people among the tribes unlike among the Dalits and therefore they should not be given rights and Thakkar Baba is saying well actually there is you know there are 122 graduates among the scheduled tribes and so on so this whole uh, kind of protectionism the fact that Adivasis were not seen as uh, citizens like everybody else in fact seeps into the constitution in the fifth and sixth schedules so when you need to think about the constitution as ideology one needs to think not just about what the provisions have but the ideology of the members of that time who were debating these issues what else was going on because there were actually a number of Adivasi movements there was the Telangana struggle the Tibhaga struggle the Warli movement there was the armed resistance uh, I mean there was the Kharsawan uh, agitation there was the Jhar uh, movement for uh, statehood. So there were a number of cases where Adivasis were actually demanding rights in the same way that they are today. But all of that was ignored in terms of, uh, in favor of having this extremely protectionist and watered down version of protection for Adivasi rights. So I'll just end on that saying that we need uh, two things. To think of the text, the courts, and the people as three important elements and look at it as a progressive document which needs to be defended in terms of certain progressive values rather than the actual provisions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nandini. You see, there's a very important point which you have just raised. I mean, this, uh, this kind of uh, debate between uh, uh, Thakkar Baba and Ambedkar. I mean, you know, why are we so shy? I mean, you know, uh, uh, the... the 
the boils and warts. I mean, why are we afraid of talking about them? You know, take everything at face value. I mean, why are we putting everything under the carpet? I mean, why do we want to sugarcoat and dress and, you know, uh, candy floss and that kind of thing? I mean, let things come out of a dialectic. So that's that's very important point. I mean, you know, uh, somebody, I mean, some people present here won't, may, may not like uh, criticizing Ambedkar. But you see, the point is that, I mean, here there, there, was, a, there was a fault line, you know, when, uh, the, uh, when the tribals were not given their due at that point of time. So anyway, now I'll uh, request uh, Vivek to uh, come on stage, please. Thank you, uh, Suhasji. Uh, it's a really challenging uh, job uh, to speak after Professor Balveer Arora and uh, Nandini Sundar uh, and uh, Professor Arora, not directly my teacher, but we have seen him uh, as our professors and learned in debates in GNU. Uh, so, well, uh, three points which I want to make quickly. One is that constitution do not be located in isolation, in vacuum. They have to be located in some social structure. And uh, uh, once you locate them in social structure, the second point which comes to my mind is that, why is it so difficult to treat this constitution as an ideology for governance? If you really have the nature of social structure in your mind, then and then only you can think of that, why is it so difficult? And third, uh, can you make uh, constitutional values irrelevant without changing the basic structure of the constitution? That is also uh, there. So these three points which I like to make, and therefore I begin from my own vantage point. I have a vantage point, a standpoint rather, uh, from uh, not only an ontological basis, but epistemic basis as well, that India's founding fathers and mothers, they have an ideal, uh, a national, national ideal for, from the constitution. And I take it from uh, uh, Granville, of course, Austin, and he talks about that there were three idols, ideals to be uh, realized. One was, of course, the national unity. Uh, second uh, was the democracy. And third was social revolution. Now, uh, he tries to argue that, yes, we have tried to achieve. But he also makes a very important point that the founding fathers and mothers could not envisage everything. They could not foresee everything which was supposed to be happening in future. And therefore, it's very important to note at this juncture that why is it uh, we feel that the constitutional uh, values are in perils. There is somewhere we try to feel that, you know, there is a direct onslaught on the uh, uh, values of the, or the constitutional value. So uh, the first point which I was trying to make that, what is the structure like? And I take it from Louis Dumas. Uh, Louis Dumas talks about that Indian society, uh, being a traditional society, has four cardinal uh, elements of the values, that one is it is holistic. Individual is not a free agent. And if individual is not a free agent, then democracy will never arrive because he will we have to part of a larger whole. And that's where I think uh, the start things start pinching to us that whether we are really an independent citizen, individuals with all our rights, or we are being actually uh, given certain rights for being certain in certain communities, or actually we have privileges because being born in certain communities, as we can see. It is hierarchical in nature and everything from uh, different aspects. Uh, the hierarchy is still uh, la uh, writ large. It is otherworldliness. There is otherworldliness in Indian society. It is still karma and dharma uh, uh, rules the roost. Last but not the least, the continuity. There's the fourth element that the sanatan. It is coming from, you know, eternity. And how can it be challenged? How can it be questioned? Now, if these are the basic structural values of the Indian society, the basic values in the preamble, they directly challenge head on. There is a head on collision with the basic egalitarian values of the constitution. Where are we going to take these, actually this, this whole uh, contradiction and this whole conflict between the 
persisting inequality and emerging equality. There is a persisting, persistence of inequality, of different types, equal inequality of inequality of say caste, class, region, religion, language, as well as uh, uh, nowadays, you know, uh, we, when, we, we, when we see the linguistic aspect, so there is inequality and, and this basically is there, there are values which have been invoked in, in the society so that equality should, should emerge. So somewhere I think there is a basic contradiction. Now if there is a basic contradiction, then who will like to implement the constitutional mechanism? And that's where I think I can take leave from Baba Sahib Dr. Bhimra Ambedkar. And this is the debate when uh, people had alleged that you have taken all the, all the uh, material from uh, Act of 1935 and you have taken all the provisions from there. So Baba Sahib Ambedkar said, yes, I have taken it from there. And these basic, uh, basic uh, uh, elements are basically uh, from administrative details only. I have taken administrative details from Act of 1935, nothing than else. So there, there was a question that why you have to take even administrative details from there and club in the Constitution. So whether the administrative details should be part of the constitution itself, that was the question. And Ambedkar very rightly said that why I am including these administrative details in the Indian constitution. And he quoted Groth, the historian of Greece, who had argued that diffusion of constitutional morality, and that's where the question today a very, very important and pertinent question that there is utter lack of constitutional morality in Indian society. And constitutional morality, while explaining constitutional morality, he says that a paramount, what is constitutional morality? And he explains a paramount reverence of the forms of the constitution, reinforcing obedience to the authority acting under, under and with these forms yet combined with the habit of open speech of action subject only to definite legal controls and unrestrained course of those very authorities as to all their public acts combined to with a perfect confidence. Now while embodying these actually uh, these administrative uh, aspects into the constitution so to preserve constitutional morality, Ambedkar argued that the constitutional morality for peaceful working of a democratic constitution is very necessary. Without constitutional morality, peaceful working of democratic constitution cannot take place. Now there are two things in this, Ambedkar argued. One, that uh, you know, uh, these two things we generally don't recognize. And he says that one is that the form of administration has a close connection with the form of constitution. So the administration, the administrative forms and, administ and the constitution, they have to go into uh, hand in hand. And second is that it is perfectly possible to prevent the constitution without changing its form by merely changing the form of administration. We have article 330, 332, 335, all is there, but are they really implemented in letter and spirit? If you really talk about reservation, the way it has been recognized, it has been, uh, you know, it has a draconian call, the way people pounce on you that uh, you know, the article has not yet been fully implemented. And yet there is a lot of propaganda that look, everything has been given uh, in the name of reservation. So I think I'm just taking you one example that how without changing the constitution, if you change the form of administration, there is basically inconsistency and that administration 
cannot be only inconsistent, but it can be opposed to the spirit of the constitution, and that's what we are witnessing. So it is possible that you don't change the constitution. So I don't feel that. Actually, I don't, I'm not perturbed when they say that, look, I will change the constitution. Even if you're not changing, whether you are really implementing it, let us spread. We have yet to see an, 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 an number of cases from Una to uh, Saharanpur. Where is the constitution? So I will say much more than the text, much more than the courts, the society itself has to take lots of uh, 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 responsibility that how society, because Ambedkar had already talked about that you cannot make a law if the majority of the people are against a particular community. So law cannot actually, you can make law for equality, you can make law for liberty, but you cannot make law for fraternity. Where, how will you make law for fraternity? And without fraternity, democracy is not going to last. And therefore, I think the need, the question which people keep on raising, is constitution, is constitution uh, merit that it can last from the test of the time? And I think that's where I would like to end. Ambedkar argued that how bad a constitution, however bad a constitution may be, it may turn out to be good if those who are called to work it happen to be a good lot. The working of a constitution does not depend wholly upon the nature of the constitution. The constitution can provide only the organs of the state, such as legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. The factors on which the working of those organs of the state depend are the people and the political parties they all set up as their instrument to carry out their wishes in the future. We have seen in the universities who has stopped to make a democratic curriculum. After 70 years of independence, we do not have a democratic curriculum. University as a site of discrimination. It is not the constitution who has punished and who has killed Rohit Vemula. It is the teachers who have been responsible for their death. It is, the, it is the teachers who do not allow to take people their own particular topic for research. Is this the university system which we are talking about? We do not teach icons of the community, of the excluded communities, and we are talking about that, look, there is a regime which is actually having an onslaught to us, I think. Therefore, my humble submission, if you really want to make constitution as an ideology, I think society has to change and it has to become democratic, much more democratic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivek. I mean, you've, uh, you've, op you've opened it up more. But, uh, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a point to be taken that uh, after 70 years, the basic contradiction between the persisting inequality, as you said, and the emerging equality has not been uh, settled. Uh, now I would uh, request Himanshu to come on. It's a difficult task, Himanshu, because uh, you're going to take up the economic aspect. And uh, you have, uh, 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 apart from the directive principles, uh, very little tangibles. But, uh, but that is the core, you know, I mean, of the Constitution. So uh, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you uh, for <coughs> inviting me. I mean, it is a challenging uh, task, at least for economist constitution, to be very honest. Uh, wouldn't mean much, to be very honest, right in the beginning except for the fact that it is a very much an integral instrument where democracies are run. That's how most of the uh, mainstream economists would think of, part of the government in that sense. But I start with what is generally asked, and when generally which is told to people, that good economics is not good politics. And this is something which is thrown into your mind every day, as if economics is separate from politics, and sometimes there is a contradiction and therefore uh, political correctness may not be the uh, economically wise thing to do. And this keeps coming to me, uh, c keeps being thrown at us, and we sometimes uh, look at it in a very uh, uh, derogatory way, very uh, insulting way, calling people as who are doing bidding of the people as populist, which is not seen as a nice thing to do. You are being 
very uh, incorrect as in the economic language. So I was thinking as to what exactly would I pick from the constitution to talk about as an ideology which is which I can think of something useful as far as economics is concerned. And it is, the entire volume, entire document itself is very much there. And I can't pick up everything. I mean, there are a lot of things which are there and I'm not coming to the directive principles. But let me pick three things which, is, which, are, which I find very important and something which is key to the way economic policy is made, the way governance is done in terms of economic sense. And these are three fundamental aspects of the constitution, not something which is which the way we look at it. And very simple in that sense. First is the, the universal suffrage in that sense. It's something which is, we take it for granted, something which is very basic, that everybody, irrespective of their educational status, economic status, caste status, religious status, is allowed to vote. Not many democracies, at least the democracies which started earlier, had you know, began with universal suffrage. And it's quite a big thing to do, that you become independent and your entire country is poor, illiterate, and you decide that everybody will have equal voting right. And in fact, that's the one point where I think the Constitution really emphasizes equality. That is the one equality that you cannot take it away. And that is one place where equality is really in the real sense of the word equality. That everybody has one single vote. The value of the vote is irrespective of how much money you owe, how, education, how much education you have, which class you belong to, which state you belong to. And the second one, I think, is again something which is picking up from what Professor Balvira Roda was saying, and I think I have a, would like to put it in a different way, is the whole notion of federalism. And again, putting it in the sense of what do we mean as a nation, what, we, what exactly do we think of it. And it's not just an arrangement, it's not just logistical arrangement. Federalism is not a logistical arrangement, and that's not the way we look at it. I think it, it, I think it means much, much more, and we have somehow forgotten how, uh, what it means in the current context. And the third one, I think, is something which Vivek has rightly pointed out, is the issue of reservation. And that's the, I think, the, I would say that the only, or I think the most important place where actually constitutions, the words which are there in quality, and the justice word actually comes only this place. So that is the only place I would say where justice actually means, I mean, there are lots of other things, right, to equality, all the rights are there. But if you are talking about justice in the sense of giving more to the people who have been excluded, marginalized, then I think the reservation is the concrete example of that justice that you can see in the Constitution. And it is there in the Constitution, it is not something which is, which can be compromised in that sense. And the reason I picked up the three is also because these are three essentially now at the current, in the last 20 to 30 years, have also come under threat in different ways. And a uh, lot of them have come from the economic side, but also come from the way the politics has been structured in that sense. I know, I, I mean, this is something which is the, true for the uh, parliament. This is true for everywhere. If you can vote, you can get elected. And the only bar is age. That is the only difference that you have. As long as you have a voting right, you are also eligible to be elected. And the only thing that is, stops you from is that you should be a particular age to become a member of parliament. But that is not true at the lower level of it. There are now 10 states where you, where you are ineligible to contest for the panchayat level elections. If you are loan defaulter, if you are not matriculate, if you are not, if you don't have, if you have children more than that, if you have, so you, in a sense, what we have now done, and which is now we are expanding to, Haryana is the latest example where you cannot become part of the political process if you do not fulfill criteria, and the number of criteria are sometimes very, very ridiculous criteria, but those are the criteria on which we have restricted the participation of people in the democratic process at the very, very lowest level. It hasn't reached to the level of member of parliaments and member of legislative assemblies, but it has reached, and it was none of this was there in the beginning in the constitution. None of this was something that the constitution makers ever thought of, of restricting anybody. Even the poorest of the person, illiterate person, completely uh, uh, with any, uh, 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 no bar was there for the person to contest, to become a member of parliament. Today, we have introduced that, and that is at the lowest level where democracy actually is functioning. So that is something which, is where there. But why is it important? The universal suffrage is important because that is the only way the policies are getting articulated. And economists have produced a number of papers giving evidence mostly in the favor that you don't need democracy for economic growth. And China is not the only example of it. I mean, a lot of East Asia is an example of it. Various other places are an example of it. But democracy is essential for policy making, particularly for economic policy making. And if you don't want to look at these empirical evidences, 
the best evidence is the voting percentages. The poor have disproportionately large faith in the state in the election process than the rich in the South Delhi or in South Mumbai. And they vote because they know that the state is the one which is our, this is something which is there, and that faith is something that is continuing even today. It is increasing. The voting percentages have increased, despite all the problems that we have. And it does. The economic system does respond to the political pressures. It does. And that is why you will find economists fuming with finance ministers or the governments for taking irresponsible political economic decisions. But they do it simply because the democracy keeps them on their toes. The second is, I think, again, uh, the federalism part of it is, again, something which is very beautifully crafted and, again, not done in a very rigid manner in that sense. But the basic principle that the states as an entity have the right to define how the state will be governed, how the economic policies will be done. And a lot of policies were there, land-related policies, agriculture-related policies were defined at the state domain. But today what we have is a system where all this, the federal structure, which is the, the kind of respect for the states to decide what they will do with their economy has been eroded. Happened with 2003, the FRBM bill, where the states were said that they cannot do beyond this. But even GST, for example, I mean, I would say that we are talking about one nation, one tax, and that's a good thing. Maybe tomorrow, tomorrow one language, one nation is also a good thing. And tomorrow one food, one country is also a good thing. One dress, one country will also be a good thing. So I think that is where one has to look at it. Because we are looking at the place where the only tax powers that the states had, they have lost now. So that is in a council where there is absolute overwhelming one third is there, the veto is with the central government. So that is one thing which has again been taken away with the, from the states. And the states have been given the power to do everything that they want to do with the population. So all the development needs have been given to the states. The taxation powers are now almost zero with the states after GST. They never had direct tax powers. Indirect tax powers are now almost zero with them. And I think it's something which we need to think about it, that what we are looking at in terms of the federal ideology in that sense. And the third is again, uh, which Vivek has already pointed out, is about reservation. And it's a very valid question. Did we mean reservations only by giving them jobs in the government uh, departments? or giving them some kind of admission assistance, I mean admission uh, quotas in the public institutions, not in the private institutions also. Or, I mean, I'm sure, and everybody will agree with this, that that was not the whole purpose of reservation. And that is not how, what we meant by it. Today, reservation means that every community today, from the prosperous communities to the richest communities, everybody is claiming to be disadvantaged, and everybody is claiming to be, and the only bar is the Supreme Court judgment that you can't cross 50%. Otherwise, the governments would have done it. And they, would, they, they have done it, every time getting stuck by the... So reservation has finally become the tool to appease, to kind of give some kind of a, uh, any, uh, 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 jobs for a particular community which feels to be aggrieved. This has happened in the C, this has happened to the STs, this is happening to the OBCs, this is happening to almost all communities in that sense. But I do think that reservation, the first basic purpose of reservation was not to just provide jobs. It was much, much, much more, and that is what Vivek highlighted, that it was meant to basically democratize the system, to instill a sense of justice in the economic policy making, in the general policy making, in the structure that we are talking about. But that sense of justice has now disappeared. It has become a sense of entitlement. And it is being talked about as if it is something that needs to give privilege to one over the other. And the community which is not getting it feels aggrieved, saying that they are being privileged. So the language has become like they're privileged and I'm not privileged to the extent that now it is now being talked about as if that some communities, I mean, some uh, the Prevention of Atrocities Act should be wiped, uh, diluted, should be removed, should be done like this and that, those kind of things. So I think the basic philosophy with which it started, basic philosophy, which is the whole purpose of an economic policy in the making in that sense had to, and it was originally in the beginning, at least adhere to these principles. Not in exactly in the sense. Political sense, it was always there. Economic sense, it was faltered. It kind of kept changing, their, changing its goalpost. But to a certain extent, the fact that everybody, even the poorest section of the population, had the power to change a government, had the power to vote out the government, meant that the government's the policy making is at least was responsive to it, not to exactly to the, that extent. And I'll just end by one anecdote that between at least from 1980s to up to 2010, almost every finance minister was defeated after their, their term was over. So the governments, I mean, the, 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 the population was very, very 
I mean, there are some exceptions, one or two, but basically, so they were very, very, uh, uh, in a sense, demanding in that sense, and they were, they were. But today, what we see is that even the judiciary, which used to, which used its powers to expand the right to life, I mean, we never, never had these any of these economic rights in that sense. Today, we are talking about right to privacy, which is where Aadhaar comes in, or we are talking about right to life being expanded into different ways, where your NF National Food Security Act comes in, your NREG in that sense got strengthens, or your even ICDS children's meal are being universalized, not because the government wants it, but because the court ordered that you make ICDS universal. The midday meal is universal, not because the government wanted it or the economic policy making wanted it, it's the court said that right to life means that the midday meal has to be universal up to the age of this. Now that is where I think the courts played the role of expanding it. And this is where the rule of was moved out from just being a political right to being expanded into an economic round. And there are endless, the, 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 the limit is, I mean, you can go on expanding these things. But I think the real question that we should be asking as an ideology in that sense of constitution being is that today what we are, the, the basic principles that we started with, how the economic policy has adhered to it. And you're right, there's nothing in the constitution which makes the government accountable on economic, the only institution in that sense, the economic institution that the constitution says in that sense is the finance commission. Every five years, the finance commission has to sit and decide the allocation of resources among different states. Other than it, even the planning commission had no legislative backing. Even uh, the, the only obligation for the finance minister is that it has to represent a budget a particular year and it has to be. But what is the con contour of that? How much of that resources will go to watch state, to which community, to which direction, to whether it will go for development or it will go for crony capitalism or it will be collected through this way or it will be destroyed, disbursed through that way. There is no such guiding principle that they there. The only guiding principle is that the, the, everybody, even the poorest, can vote and that vote matters and that decides what the government will do or not do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Himanshu. I would just like to highlight just one line from what you said, that the, uh, the teeming millions still have faith in the state, you know, and how long uh, can we continue to play with that faith? I mean, that's a very good point. Uh, now, uh, uh, without, uh, uh, without further ado, can we, uh, uh, can we open the, uh, the, uh, the meeting to questions and points or comments or something? But please... Uh, Keep it brief, and we'll take four in the first round. If there is time, we'll go ahead, because we are already uh, running. I'll just, 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 I'll just one sec. One yeah. sec. Uh, Professor Muchkund uh, wanted to... Yeah, please go ahead. I would like to raise uh, a few issues. Uh, whether uh, a development uh, uh, strategy that uh, the government has been following uh, since, uh, let us say, the early 1990s, uh, is compatible with the Constitution. Uh, and this is uh, something which uh, uh, I don't know whether it should be submitted for judicial review, uh, but just a thought. And uh, if not, uh, then uh, whether uh, the framers of the Constitution should not have, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the same time prescribed the kind of development strategy which will be compatible with the Constitution. Whether the alternatives that are being considered in the country today uh, are more compatible than the present one. Uh, so just one set of questions I would like to raise. Uh, the other thing that I would like to raise is that, uh, 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 you know, is there really a difference uh, between the directive principle of the state policy and the fundamental rights in practice. And uh, so far as uh, economic provisions are concerned, uh, because uh, 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 the, uh, we, had a, we have a law, RTE, uh, which flows from uh, a fundamental right, that is Article 21A. And yet, uh, uh, it was supposed to have been implemented in five years' time. It has not been implemented. And uh, you, if you raise this issue among people who deal with these subjects or in government circle, uh, the same old issue uh, used to be raised with regard to the directive principles 
uh, is being raised that uh, we don't have the resources. Uh, we uh, growth is important. Uh, if growth is accelerated, then we would have more resources, and out of that, we will find uh, we will look into it. The whole question of uh, secondary education having been left out of the RTE has been justified by the government openly and publicly on the ground that they don't have the resources. Uh, uh, and as uh, you know that uh, uh, pre-primary uh, uh, also on the same ground. Uh, so this is the another uh, important issue that I would like to raise. I mean, can you really say that uh, uh, there are still certain um, uh, clauses of the fundamental rights uh, uh, for which uh, resources have to be found at any cost, like law and order, uh, security of the nation, uh, which is also related to right to life. Uh, but then there are clauses like education, uh, which, uh, you know, the, the uh, discharging the obligation, legal obligation, flowing out of the fundamental rights is predicated on the availability of resources. And final point, and I'm very one word about it because it has been, a lot has been written about it, that the, you know, the deep compromise, uh, very far-reaching compromise that has been made in the federal principle uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, total planning process in the country, the total dependence of the states uh, on the central government for bulk of the development sources that they spent. And, uh, and secondly, that uh, in, and, and the uh, very, very fragile fiscal position of most of the states uh, today. And these are, they, they, are, they are really eroding the federal principle as many other factors. Thank you. Uh, the the whole issue of cultural change is the most important uh, point which today the entire Indian population is facing. Having said that, it is very necessary that the constitution should be taught at a school level, at college level, at every level. That is the most important thing starting from preamble. The second submission which I'd like to uh, point out uh, is that the the fight for fifth and sixth schedule, I mean, the, the debate was more on the insertion of the word Adivasi. Okay? And that has been made by Jaipal Singh and Jaipal Singh was countered by K.M. Munshi uh, in, the, in the entire explanation. So you cannot blame Dr. Ambedkar for that. And even for that matter, blaming Ambedkar for not agreeing to the uh, tribal votes is also wrong. Because if you go and read the entire minutes of the South Borough Committee report, and the representation made by Dr. Ambedkar, he makes it very clear because that is the that is exclusively talking about the CP and Berar and the and and the uh, Bombay presidency. There he says, "I'm not averse. I'm not averse to the tribal representation." That is very clear. So to say that he was against the tribal representation is totally miscalculated, misplaced, and totally wrong. It's an outright reading of the evidence and, pro and projecting Dr. Ambedkar in a very bad light. Now, the second thing is that uh, this, this uh, uh, whole aspect of um, uh, this directive principles, you know, that's a very good conversation between Dr. Ambedkar and Mulkara Janan. And there he says, there are things in the directive principles which the next generation has to fight. And that is how we have a good explanation of right to education and all those things. And the last point which I'd like to submit uh, is that the, say for example, the, we, we always expect our government to act as an agency of change. And the constitution is directed as an agency of change rather than an agency of control. Now, having said that, you know, one of the fundamental things which also we need to discuss or we need to bring out is the ways in which the judiciary is understanding. Say, for example, when it comes to the appointment of the Supreme Court judges, there is absolutely no mention of the word concurrence, but it has been interpreted as concurrence. Whereas Dr. Ambedkar in constant assembly debate and later even in the parliament makes it very clear that consultation does not mean concurrence. So how do we really go in 
in in solving those problems and make the people who are at the helm to realize what are the aspirations and how you really uh, aspire to become a good nation and 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 thereby create a good citizens of the republic of government of india thank you very enlightening to listen to all the four distinguished speakers i wanted to uh, ask one question that in this age of globalization the pressures for extreme nationalism on the basis of ideology seems to be posing a great uh, sense of uh, insecurity for citizens how do we respond to it after all when you talk about public majority of the people of india have no clue no knowledge nothing uh, nothing they know nothing about the constitution because they are incapable only about 6% or 7% of the population might have had some access to the constitution that's the data which is often quoted by political scientists but my first question was this that today in the basis of ideology this pressure for extreme nationalism and secularism is interpreted as uh, hindu rashtra i was also looking for some solutions coming out of the topic collectively we have always thought of redistribution not production okay now we open it to the panel uh, 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 Well, Imran, should we just quickly? I, 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 I think uh, very important uh, intervention by uh, Professor Muskundove. Just to say that uh, the Constitution does not lay out any development strategy, and it should not. The Constitution lies, I mean, lays down certain principles, and those principles are already there. Economic policy, in that sense, as long as we maintain the basic structure of it, the basic electoral process, the basic faith in the system i think the nitty gritties of that can be worked out at some point of time and uh, what you are talking about the right to education i think it's important for right to health it's important for many many different uh, issues in that sense forget about all those things even basic human rights are not implemented fully but that doesn't mean that i mean you you still have uh, human rights being violated on a day to day basis for almost every community in this uh, country but i think the best way to respond is not to put it in a book and put it in line by line that this is how you should be doing it this is how you should be doing it but is to basically strengthen the process through which the constitution basically derives its authority constitution does not derive its authority by some very enlightened people sitting in a room and deciding that this is how the country will be run that mandate was given by the people of this country and as long as the people of this country think that this is the constitution this is the rule by which the country has to be run then i think the processes are working as long as that is not being broken down so i think those issues need to be worked out and as long as these principles of equality justice and that's what i think about it that the resolution is not about option opportunities but uh, it's about justice and i think those principles are to be adhered to and all those things that we are talking about in the constitution and the last question i think which was there on the i i, I do agree with you that over the last 20 25 years especially since 1991 we have actually weakened the entire federal structure the way the federal structure would have evolved and i think the way we thought of nation is now different than what we were talking about in the 1950s and and this whole concept of this homogenization of nation in all aspects of it not just in the fiscal and the economic aspect of it and this is slowly becoming more and more Uh, 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 dangerous uh, uh, territory in the sense where states are competing to become one in that sense is uh, which is weaker weaken and this is a process that started with the frbm act where you took away the fiscal power of the states and after that it has been a number of steps the gst has been the last one where actually uh, the, the entire economic policy has been uh, reduced to just a mathematical calculation that the state budgets will be uh, reduced to Uh, uh that is something which is detrimental to the way the states have operated because most of the ideas that we are talking about today whether it is icds or the midday meal or it is various other ideas that we are talking about it all came from states it did not come from the center all of these were implemented by populist the so called populist leaders in the in different states and that's how, including nrega which was still implemented in maharashtra or in the right to information or various things that we are talking about today 
which come to have all been experimented in the states which have then be adopted by the central government so the federalism was the spirit by which you allowed states to develop new uh, solutions rather than saying that no we have found the solution accept all of it so i think that is the real danger of uh, uh, that we have done is destroyed the basic ca characteristics of federalism Yes, I think uh, I continue a little on the theme uh, on the issues that Professor Moskundube raised, and what supplement what Imanshu has just said. The uh, the entire approach to the states and the initiatives that they can take has changed quite radically in the last few years. <coughs> Professor Dubey referred to the old planning from above, uh, uh, the problems that we had with that. Uh, now we have a new institution, and it's celebrating its third anniversary. And what it says as its definition, it, it is the standard bearer of cooperative federalism. What it says, uh, the claim it makes, is that we've brought together states and ensured that they work together. Now, this kind of uh, dirigism, the, that you are uh, the, the super um, uh, coordinator who will ensure, is made possible precisely by the kinds of legislation that Himashu referred to. FRBM, GST, uh, the resources that were transferred by the 14th Finance Commission were largely uh, taken from uh, the, the existing uh, central schemes and uh, made over. But what actually has, uh, uh, to what extent they have increased the capacities of the states to spend, uh, including on rights-based legislation like right to education. It's, it's uh, something that needs uh, more uh, looking into, but there's simultaneously other um, studies which show that uh, funds come, but there's lack of capacity to spend. And there is unspent allocated funds for many of the issues, uh, for many of the social sector uh, functions that uh, Professor Dubey pointed to. The second point I'd like to pick up, I think it's important, is this question of nationalism. It seems the, uh, the, there were some who thought that the 20th century would see the back of nationalism. But no, it seems that we are living in a, a resurgence of nationalism globally, uh, and some even go so far as to call it the age of nationalism. Nationalism as it is being propagated and promoted in our own country is, in my view, a threat to the constitutional ideology that we have been talking about. And this tendency to brand anyone who stands by uh, the values of the constitution as anti-national is something that speaks for itself. So we have to Across this phase, we are not alone. Uh, we have Turkey as a companion. We have the United States as a companion. So we, we are in distinguished company. <laughs> but uh, we have to uh, deal with our own issues. Vivek? Yeah, I'll just address the issue about the fifth and sixth schedule. Um, well, as it happened, thanks to this seminar, I spent the day reading the rereading the Constitution Assembly debates on the fifth and sixth schedules. And the issue is not that, uh, you know, there's no, I'm not blaming Ambedkar for the final form. In fact, uh, Dr. Ambedkar was not active in the final debates on the 5th and 6th schedule. And it closes with K.M. Munshi giving an explanation and Ambedkar saying, I have nothing more to add to that. Uh, the actual issues raised in that, in fact, there wasn't much debate. Uh, 
not as much as they could have been. Rajendra Prasad, the president, is constantly saying, we don't have time for debate, etc. And um, it's the whole, um, the actual substantive points of debate were raised by Jaipal Singh, who pointed out that the original recommendations of the drafting committee, both the Bordolai committee and the Thakkar committee, had been considerably watered down in two respects. One is the dilution of powers given to the Tribes Advisory Council, and this is where I come to it, that should we take the final text of the, the fifth and sixth schedule as the final given, or look at what went into the making of the fifth and sixth schedule, which is, in fact, what people are asking for today. So what we see in struggles today to defend land rights, to defend other things, are, in fact, people unconsciously raising the same demands that were actually there in the earlier draft of the schedule. So there is a sense in which it's important to look at the Constitution not just as a finished text, but in terms of the debates that went into it, which continue to be active today. Second, in, uh, so one was the question of the dilution of the Tribes Advisory Council. The second was in terms of the question of whether some of the provisions, so the, actually the fifth schedule as it stands says uh, the governor shall report only on scheduled areas. And uh, Jaipal Singh, who was the most important Adivasi leader at that time in the constitutional framework, said that it should also include scheduled tribes. And this is actually a very important debate for reservation because the argument that K. Munshi came up with for leaving scheduled tribes out was saying that if you have a scheduled tribe person who comes to Delhi, will you still worry about their welfare and advancement and their rights? Which is, in fact, Jaipal Singh was saying that, yes, regardless of whether, wherever they are, whether they're in scheduled areas, whether they're out of it, they should be of concern as a minority. And that is the premise of reservation, which is, in fact, being attacked, that you know the whole creamy layer argument that once you're in Delhi, etc., and people have consistently, through studies, shown that regardless of reservation at one level, you continue to need it, that there are all sorts of offsets. So this is, a, anyways, a side debate. But eventually what happened in the making of the final fifth schedule was Thakkar, uh, A.V. Thakkar and the drafting committee, um, which is Dr. Ambedkar and others, coming to some kind of compromise and, in fact, overturning the provisions of the draft uh, thing committee. So this is not, what I was trying to say is that at that time, all the people in this kind of mainstream liberal uh, framework actually did not recognize Adivasi rights. They did not recognize the capacity of Adivasis to govern themselves. And this extended even to somebody like uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Leave alone, you know, other various other people. So, no, I think, no can I just finish? Yeah. And if you actually look at, and I think it's important to just look at some of the debates that were happening in the press, that were happening among various proponents of rights. And it's also important to remember that, that at that point in Telangana during the armed struggle, Adivasis were being put into concentration camps. So the same government, which in 1949 is talking about rights in the fifth and sixth schedule, is actually setting up concentration camps called Jawahar Nagar, uh, you know, various Ashoka Nagar, etc., into which Adivasis were being herded as if they had no rights. So there is, it's important to look at the Constitution in terms of a wider historical framework. And this is not to cast aspersions on anybody, but just simply to say that let's Look at it as a living document, both at that time and now. Can, uh, now, I think uh, it's uh, about time that, uh, you know, I mean, you can't have such a, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a, been a, such a vast subject, you know, and to squeeze it in into 90 minutes as these four panelists have laudably done, I think is amazing. So we, we should, in fact, uh, have a kind of a two-day or a three-day kind of a, you know, seminar uh, across in, in IIC, probably, plan it in a big way and have a national debate on this. Because this is very important because, uh, I mean, uh, you know, this, this country exists because of the Constitution. And the Constitution has to be defended. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, as I just need to make one very no, sorry, important no, no, point. We can, we'll have to close now. I'm sorry. We oh, can, there's we'll a very it, so, important yeah. point no, which needs to be no, understood. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no, we'll have to close. It's 8 o'clock. Okay, so we'll have to close now. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot.